Hi everyone, welcome back. After all the holidays concluded, the holidays, uh, the month of Tishrei, this sicha was said by the Rebbe in uh, uh, in Parshas Noach, this parsha, in 1982, um, the third day of Cheshvan. So we just finished the month of Tishrei. Tishrei is the head and all-encompassing month of the entire year, the Rebbe says. He says that through Tishrei, a person's avoda, a person's service for the rest of the year is determined. Um, through teshuva, through prayer, through acts of kindness. Every holiday, every aspect of Tishrei is significant for us for the rest of the year as well. And it makes us better and improves us for the rest of the year as well. As in the month of Tishrei, we are very actively involved in synagogue life and Jewish life and godly life. So we should be the rest of the year as well. Uh, it should be like that also. Tishrei is a month that literally takes us off, takes us uh, to another planet, another place. And indeed, during the rest of the year also, we should be influenced by those aspects of Tishrei, which are very, very special to us and which enhance our avoda, our service to God, uh, for the rest of the year as well. Um, the Rebbe points out in Rosh Hashanah, we crown God as our king. Um, awe and nullification flow into the entire world then. Um, on uh, Sukkot, everything of Rosh Hashanah that is concealed, in a concealed way, becomes revealed and open, causing great joy. This is also in connection with the heart, for in Sukkot, we perform the mitzvah of lulav. Lulav in Hebrew can be divided into lo lev, which means to him a heart. Shemini Yetzeres, which follows Sukkot, uh, all matters are drawn down for the whole year in the inner matter, concrete and actual, not just in, in an external form. We just dance our heart our heart away on, um, on Simchas Torah. So in other words, throughout the holidays, throughout the holiday period, our service to God is enhanced, the Rebbe says. So the purpose of man's service to God is to carry out God's desire to have a dwelling place in this lower world. The whole purpose of why we are here is to create a dwelling place for God to dwell in this world, that every aspect of this world should be influenced and guided by God's hand. It's not sufficient to work on oneself, but rather... One must influence the world to be a fit place for God's dwelling. And this is done through the observance of Torah and the performance of mitzvahs, such that every day, uh, every day should be enhanced, should be improved through the observance of Torah and mitzvahs. And this is the concept of Shabbos Bereshis, which ends the entire holiday cycle. Last Shabbos was the Shabbos that we read the portion of Bereshis. And it follows all of the holidays. When a God reads and learns Torah, uh, God reads and learns opposite us. God is there with us. God is our study partner. When a, a Jew learns Parshas Bereshis and reads that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, God learns the same thing. Since God looked into the Torah and created the world, God's readiness, God's reading uh, these words creates the heavens and the earth anew. So again, the influence of Shabbos Bereshis is felt, felt throughout the rest of the year also. Um, anyhow, in connection with Noah, Noah is a bit of a different situation. While but during the holidays we were in a different world, um, we were involved with synagogue and, and Avodah Hashem and the mitzvahs and Torah study and and one mitzvah, one holiday after the other. Noah always comes during the month of Cheshvan. And Cheshvan is not a month with any holidays to it. It's called Mar Cheshvan, the bitter Cheshvan. Why? Because it is devoid of holidays. Cheshvan is a month that is just a regular month. You go to work, you go out there, you do what you have to do during the, during the month of Cheshvan. As we'll see later, Hasidim have a custom that at the end of Simchas Torah, they declare in Shul, the Yaakov Halach Ludarko, Yaakov goes on his way. It's time now to go back into the world and um, resume life as usual in the world. And that is the, the service of the month of Cheshvan. 
And that is indeed what, what Parsha Noach is all about as well. Uh, the Rebbe continues that um, um, Shabbos itself is above and beyond time. Shabbos Bereshis, which sets the tone for the entire year, causes the creation to be renewed in a completely new fashion. Every time, every day, every moment, creation is anew. Man's service, which is to be, prepare the world for God's presence. And uh, through man's service, the world is prepared for God's presence in a fashion infinitely loftier than at the beginning of creation. When man gets to work, goes back into the world, resumes his daily activities in the world, man indeed is making the world into a godly place. What do you think God prefers? The holidays or mundane, regular, plain existence? Well, I would say the holidays are very nice because like, we have a special relationship with God during that time. But what God really wants is to get us to get back to business, to get into the world, to make the world into a holy, a special place, a pure place, by, by acting honestly in the, in the world, by giving charity in the world, by being nice to our family and spending time with our family. And all of these things, we create a dira betachtainim, a dwelling place in the low physical world. And that is what God really wants. Does God, God loves the holidays and all the spirituality in the holidays, but God can do without it. God lives among angels and among holy souls in heaven and lofty and pure elements. So for him, the holidays are nice, but um, he could do without them. But when it comes to mundane, plain existence, God looks at all of us and says, wow, look at that guy. He's working on, he's, he's building a business and he's making money, which he's gonna give to charity and he's gonna help his family and he's going to provide employment for many people, and he's going to make the world into a better place. That is something very special. In many respects, it's even higher than all the holidays combined. And that is really the finish. The finish is everything, as they say. The finish and the completion of the month of Tishrei, including Shabbos Bereshis, is the last day of the month. Uh, this Shabbos, Shabbos Parshas Noach, which follows the end of Tishrei, as we said, it always takes place during Cheshvan. It, 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 uh, indeed, the elevation caused by Shabbos Parshas Noach applies even to Shabbos Bereshis. For Shabbos Bereshis is always in the middle of Tishrei, and Shabbos Noach is always in the month of Cheshvan. So Shabbos Noach, Parshas Noach, is the completion of Tishrei, the end of Tishrei, and bringing the elements of Tishrei into the physical world. Parshish Noach affects an elevation and perfection in the act of creation in regards to making this world a dwelling place for God. And we take a look at Parshish Noach. What happened during Noach? Well, we have a whole generation of people that sinned, they were corrupt, they hurt each other, they, they, um, they corrupted each other, they stole from each other, they interbreeded among species, and it was a very, very bad, evil area, a very bad place to be. So what did God do? God took Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives together in an ark. But was that all he took? No, he took animals, the lowest of the species. He took from the highest of the species to the lowest of the species. He took even little insects into the ark, two of each kind and seven of each kind. Why two of each kind? Because these were the non-kosher animals. Seven of each kind with the kosher animals, male and female. Why did he need seven, of, seven males and seven females of each kind? That was a lot of animals. Because after the flood, he's going to make several sacrifices. And if he had only two of each kind, once he made a sacrifice with one of them, that would be the end of the uh, species. They couldn't procreate. So therefore, he needed more than just two of each kind. He needed seven of each kind in order to continue the species together. And what did Noah spend all of his time doing in the ark? What was he doing in the ark? Was he studying Torah? Was he praying? No, he was taking care of animals. He was feeding animals. In fact, we're, there's a famous midrash that tells us that um, one day he came late to feed the lions and, they, and the lion bit him. And uh, Noah was exhausted from all the work that he was doing day and night. He was an old man. 
And here he had to feed all the animals and he had to feed them on time yet, which he did. The fact that the story about the lion tells us that the lion was angry at him was because the lion expected and received his food on time each and every day for the entire time they were on the ark. So Noah did take care of the animals and he took, took care of them in a timely fashion. When they were supposed to eat each one their own schedule, he took care of them. And that's what he was busy doing the whole time, taking care of the animals. Later, after the ark, when man became a farmer, man also was in charge of fields and animals and crops and all kinds of things like that. And this is really the epitome of making the world into a holy place, taking the very physical world and making it into a holy place. Noah obviously cared for the animals and take, took care of them. And they appreciated very much what he did. It's interesting that, um, that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, prophet Isaiah talks about how the, when the Mashiach comes, the wolf, the wolf will lay down with the lamb, that the violent, ferocious animals will coexist peacefully with the non-violent non, non animals that the wolves, which are considered very ferocious, will sit down safely with the lambs, and the lambs will have nothing to fear from the wolves. This is very much an element of the times of Mashiach, when in the times of the Messiah, we were also told the same thing, that the violent, that the, uh, the, the evil, the, the tough nations will sit down together with the peaceful, more genteel nations in peace. And that's why it says that when Noah left the ark, it didn't say he left the ark, but he caused the animals to go out of the ark. The animals didn't want to leave the ark. They wanted to stay in the ark because it was a very peaceful, happy existence for them. They were fed properly. There was no fighting. They didn't have to fear for their lives or anything like that. They wanted to stay in the ark. But Noah said, no, it's time for you to go out and to repopulate the world and make the world into a better place. And that was their purpose. So reluctantly, the animals left the ark. But the ark, in many respects, was a, a, a um, prototype of the times of Mashiach, when everybody will get along so well with each other. Um, the Rebbe continues, he says, Parshas Noah affects an element, an elevation and perfection in Shabbos Bereshis in regards to making this world a dwelling place for God. So Shabbos Parshas Noah not only is in the month of Mar Cheshvan, when the main work of dealing with the world is performed, but also is the elevation of the finish and indeed the conclusion of Shabbos Bereshis. So it is the conclusion of it and the purpose of it all is in Parshas Noah. And indeed taking care of the animals is a sign, a symbol of what that is all about. When we take care of the animals, which are the lowliest creatures, and we care for them, therefore we're making the world into a holy place, into a godly place. And uh, indeed, there are many halachas dealing with the care of animals. For example, we're not allowed to eat before we feed our animals. Our animals are not allowed to work for us on Shabbos, our yanta. Um, we have to be kind to animals. All the many mitzvahs dealing with Sar Chayim, with um, preventing pain to animals. We are allowed to eat animals, we're allowed to slaughter them, but we need to do it in a humane way. We're not allowed to torture animals. Many, many laws dealing with that. In fact, we find that some of the most famous uh, serial killers started out when they were children by torturing animals animals, and they graduated later on to torturing people. The way we treat our animals is very much a reflection of how we treat our fellow human beings. And if we're kind to animals, we're more likely to be kind to our fellow human beings as well. There's an interesting story which I heard recently from a, um, uh, it was told by one of the uh, secretaries of the Rebbe, Rebbe Minyamin Klein told the story that he heard himself from the person that it happened to, that there was once a professor, a Jewish professor in England, who used to come to the United States quite often. And uh, he came on business. And um, whenever he came to the United States, he always stopped off at the graveside of the Rebbe 
Uh, you know that the Rebbe is buried in the Montefiore section, Montefiore Cemetery in Queens, New York, which is right next to J JFK Airport. So whenever he would come into JFK from England, he always stopped off at the grave of the Rebbe before he went on his way to um, his hotel room or his businesses. One time he got into JFK, it was late at night, and uh, he had trouble finding a cab, finally found a cab, and uh, he told the cab driver that he needs to go to a particular hotel in Manhattan, but on the way he wants him to stop off at a grave in Queens, New York, where he needs to go there for a few more minutes to pray. The cab driver was astounded. It was very late at night. He's going to go to a cemetery at night. It's going to be scary over there. Why do you want to go there? Well, the professor said to him, well, I'm Jewish, and I'm a follower of a, a, follower of a very great rabbi who passed away in New York called the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and I always go to his grave, and I pray there whenever I'm in New York. The cab driver was astounded. He said, really? He said, uh, well, I'm Jewish. Can I, can I go? And the professor said, sure. He said, yeah, but how much does it cost to go? It must be very expensive. He said, no, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, but it's late at night. He said, it's open 24 hours a day. Uh, do you need to make a reservation? Do you need a ticket or something to get in? The professor said, no, we just walk right in and we say our prayers. Well, the... Uh, Taxi driver said, well, can I go Can I go with you when you go in? He said, sure. So they went and they stopped off at the grave of the Rebbe. And the two of them walked into the gravesite area. It's a little, it's a small building. It's open. And you walk inside the building. It's open to the sky. And uh, the Rebbe is buried there along with his father-in-law. So the two of them are there, and the professor takes out the uh, Mayana Lush and takes out the book of prayers which are said at the grave, and he starts reciting them. And as he's reciting them, he notices next to him the taxi driver is crying his eyes out. Tears are flowing like water, crying and crying. And the, the uh, professor was very touched by this. And he continued praying, and he waited until the taxi driver had finished crying. And then they left. They went into the car. And the professor said, excuse me, but who were you praying? Why were you crying so much? The taxi driver said, well, I'll explain to you. Our dog is very sick, and he's got to have a, a serious operation, and he may not make it through the operation. So I was just hoping and praying that he would be okay during the operation. We love him very much, and we hope he'll make it. We hope he'll survive. He's been with us for a long time. The professor looked at him and says, you're praying for a dog? That's why you're praying? You went to the grave to pray for a dog? The, the man said, well, yes, we will explain to you. We were married, and we were married for many years. We couldn't have any children. And uh, so someone suggested we get a dog. So we got this dog many years ago, and the dog has been a part of our family. We love the dog very much. So um, I don't want the dog to die. So the professor understood. He said, oh, I see now. He said, I'm sorry for not being more sympathetic. He said the professor took out a card from his pocket, and he said, here, this is my phone number. Please call me and tell me how the operation went. I'm concerned. Let me know how it went. He felt bad for the man. So uh, the man said he would. And that was it. The professor went on his way. Uh, several weeks went by. He didn't hear from the guy. He forgot all about it. A few years went by. And one day, the professor got a phone call from, guess who? The taxi driver. The taxi driver said, oh, do you remember me? It took a while for the professor to remember him. But he finally said, oh, yes, 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 yes. He still, the taxi driver said, well, you know, uh, our dog got completely better after our visit to the OHEL, completely recovered. And we felt, you know what, if the Rebbe can do that for a dog, maybe he can do it for us also. So we went to the grave of the Rebbe again, and we prayed for a child. And we just had a child a few weeks ago, and just today was the bris of our son. It was a miracle from heaven. And I just wanted to call and tell you that. So the professor said, well, thank you very much, but why didn't you call me before when your dog got better? Why are you waiting now for such a long time? And the man said, well, to tell you the truth, I saw that you really didn't care about my dog too much. So I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to trouble you. But I thought that after our child was born, you might be interested in that one. So that's why I'm calling you now. So indeed, the child was very, very special, but the dog was also special. 
It turns out that the, uh, the ta taxi driver, after his first trip to the Ohel, went, went, uh, went home and he talked to his wife about his experience. And they got in touch with a rabbi. And the rabbi introduced them to the laws of family purity of Taras Meshbacha and the laws of Shabbos. And they started keeping Shabbos and the woman started to go to the mikvah. And then the child was born about a year later. So we see that, uh, you know, the miracles that happen in our daily life, especially when we visit the Ohel like that. But the fact is that the dog incident was really what brought them to Yiddishkeit. Through the love of their dog and through the care of their dog, it really brought them to observance of, of Judaism. They met the professor and the professor uh, showed some interest in the dog. And uh, they felt that the Rebbe's bracha had brought the dog back to life. So therefore, the, um, it brought them back to, to mitzvahs. I remember years ago when I first came to this community in University City in San Diego, that I got a call from a couple who are still with us. And they said, Rabbi, uh, we know you just moved here. Our dog just died. Could you please come and say a prayer and do a funeral for our dog? My son, my little son would really appreciate it. So I thought to myself, well, I don't have too much experience in doing funerals for dogs, but you got to start sometime. So I went over to their house and I see the dog lying dead on the sidewalk. And the little boy, who couldn't be more than six years old, seven years old, was sitting next to the dog crying. He misses his dog. So I said a prayer for the dog, and we said to heal him, and we said a few words about the dog until the animal control people came and took him away. And that experience made the little boy and the family feel much, much better. That the rabbi who is concerned with people is also concerned about the dog. But it's not so much the dog that I was concerned about. I was concerned about the little boy and his feelings and the parents and their feelings because people get very attached to animals. And indeed, kindness to animals and showing respect for animals is a very important part of Jewish life. I have a friend who is a shochet. He is a ritual slaughter in a prominent slaughterhouse in, uh, in Iowa. And he would tell me that in between their shifts, the uh, shochtim would sit down by a table and they would have their lunch or their dinner, which their wives had prepared for them. And very often, some of these animals would come walking by and, um, and sniff the food. And uh, the shochet would take some of his food and give it to the little lamb and give it to him, pat him, make him feel good. And uh, so it would go, and then the, the, the bell would ring, the shochet was back on duty, and he took the, ram, the lamb and he would shaft it. He would slaughter it. That's what he did. That's what slaughterhouses do. So even though it's permissible to slaughter sheep and cows and calves for food, but nevertheless, it should be done in a humane way, in a way that is not painful, and that is the Jewish way to do it. So the, the uh, concern for animals is very much like the concern for people. If you are kind to animals, you're more likely going to be kind, kind to people. On the other hand, there are some people who are kind to animals, but they're not very kind to people. And if you were to ask some of these people, if you had a choice of saving your dog from a hurricane or a total stranger, a human being who's a total stranger, who would you save? Most people would probably say their dog. You'd say, why? But they're only an animal. You'd say, well, because I love my dog. And I don't know that stranger. A stranger is a total stranger to me. That itself is not appropriate either. We have to recognize that a dog is a dog. A human being is a human being. And they are completely different one from the other. He says also, interestingly, that the building of, of, the, uh, of the third temple has significance. In fact, the, the, uh, in the month of Cheshvan, the um, Mishkan was completed in the desert, but God instructed Moshe to wait, wait until the following Tishrei to start using it. So the building of the third temple has, this has special significance to the month of Cheshvan. It says here the Midrash relates that the waters of the flood, which continued for 40 days, began to come down in strength during the month of Cheshvan. 
every year, although the flood was in the past, was in the past, these 40 days con continued to have an adverse effect on the world through the service of King Shlomo in building the Beis Amigdash, these 40 days ceased to have any such effects. So during the, um, the building of the temple by King Solomon, there were no ill effects during that time. And in fact, after that time, until finally in Tishrei also was dedicated. The Midrash continues further, that although the Beis Amigdash was completed in Marcheshvan, as I said, God wanted that it should be opened for service in the month of Tishrei, the month in which Abraham was born, he was born during the month of Tishrei. Thus it was closed for 12 months until the following Tishrei, almost an entire year. God will repay the month of Cheshvan for losing the merit of having the Beis HaMikdash open then by building the third Beis HaMikdash in the month of Cheshvan. So it's because we were not able to use the first temple for 12 months, starting the month of Cheshvan, even though it was built then, uh, the third Beis HaMikdash, which is the final one, which Mashiach will inaugurate and build, will be completed and used during the month of Cheshvan. And in fact, the Ark is a symbol of Mashiach in many respects. First of all, the Ark had in it animals which normally are, are peaceful towards each other, as I said before, and it was a very utopian existence in the Ark, just like it will be with Mashiach. The third temple is infinitely greater than the Mishkan that Moshe built even. It's even greater than the tabernacle that Moshe built in the desert or the first temple that King Solomon built, or the second temple that Ezra built. For while they did not last forever, the third base of Migdash will be eternal. It will last forever. This base of Migdash, this temple, will exert its influence on the entire world, sending its light and illumination to all parts of the globe. And it is the service of Jews in exile to reveal God's presence in the world, thus converting the exile to redemption. So our job really in this world is to help build the second, build, help build the third temple. And how do we do that? By doing mitzvahs, by acting in a godly way, we merit to rebuild the third, the third temple. It says here, these days are remembered and kept when we remember and learn about the concept of the month of Mar Cheshvan, God, who in his Torah has said that Mar Cheshvan will be repaid by building the third temple then, fulfills this promise. Torah has promised that Yisrael will eventually repent at the end of the exile, and immediately they will be redeemed as soon as they repent in the true and complete redemption through Mashiach. So as I mentioned before, I mentioned before that there's a, there's a custom in Chabad that after Simchus Torah, we announce Yaakov Halach Ladarko. Uh, Yaakov went on his way. For at the conclusion of all the holidays of Tishrei, the service of a Jew in the world begins, equipped with the spiritual baggage acquired during Tishrei. Likewise, now at the end of Tishrei or beginning of Cheshvan, all the guests that would come to New York, that would come and visit us are, go are going away, they're going home. And you have to understand that in New York, during the uh, heyday of Colonel Heights and the Revolution Alive, and things were really hopping in New York. Thousands upon thousands of people came from all over the world to come to New York and spend the holidays at the Rebbe in New York similar in many respects to the way it was in the olden days, when people would come to the Baal Shem Tov or to, to the Mesut Shemagid, and they would participate in all the holidays during that time as well. I, I don't know if the women liked it so much because they were usually at home, but the men looked forward to it. They came and they participated and they joined together with the Torah learning and the inspirational davening. So the women, I'm sure, could understand how the men wanted it and how important it was to them. So in New York, people would come from all over the world and spend the holidays with the Rebbe. And at the end of Shabbos Barachas, they would all go home. 
they would all leave. And there were buses and there were planes chartered and, and all kinds of vehicles leaving New York. And this caused the Rebbe some anguish and sadness because he, he, was, in, he was infused with an aspect of, of joy and happiness and unity among all the Jews all over the world during this very special time. And now they were all leaving. And so it is, he says, at the end of Tishrei, guests are returning back to their homes. We're all going home, so to speak. When Jews are together, united, it's a very great thing. How is it possible then for one Jew to part from another, the other said? How can one person go away from another person? All your friends and relatives. They said, the Baal Shem Tov interpreted the verse in Tehillim. The steps of a man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. In the following manner, when a Jew finds himself in a, um, in a particular place, and if you end up in a certain place, it is because the steps of man are ordered by God. They're commanded by God. God puts you in that particular place. You're there for a reason. He has been sent to that place by divine providence to fulfill the mission in the dissemination of Torah and Judaism in that particular place. He tells a story about the Rabbi Yosef, uh, Yosef Weinberg, one of the emissaries of the Rebbe, who used to travel all over the world raising funds for the Rebbe's yeshivas and central institutions. And uh, very often the Rebbe would send him to various places with a particular mission in mind. One time he ended up, I think, in, in Madagascar, in some far out country in Africa. And uh, the Rebbe sent him with a Tanya, sent him with a book of Hasidic philosophy, the classic book of Hasidic philosophy of Chabad and said, when you encounter a Jew over there, give him this. Well, Rabbi Weinberg had no idea there were any Jews who lived in this place. It was a very odd, very far off place, far away from civilization. Where in the world is he going to find another Jew? But you never know. So he took the, he took the book, and he is uh, walking around, and he's going to do his uh, businesses or wherever. He it was actually, a, was the, the flight was, was uh, was uh, was held back over there. He was that was not his destination, but he was waiting, I guess, in the airport. So he had several t several hours to kill. So he decided to take a walk around. Maybe he'll find a Jew over there somewhere in the streets of this town. So he walked around, and he looked around, and lo and behold, a, a gentleman came up to him, and said to him, "Are you a rabbi?" And he said, "Yes." He said, "I can't believe you're here." I've been praying for a rabbi to come here all these years, and I haven't, I haven't seen anybody here. And Larry Weinberg was astounded. And he said, well, I, I guess I have a gift for you. He said, you have a gift for me? You don't even know me. He said, yes, I, I, don't, I may not know you, but there's a rabbi in New York who does know you. And he told me to give this to you. And he gave him to Tanya. And he kept in touch with this man for many, many years later, and this man, and man ended up moving from there into a larger uh, Jewish community, having children and marrying them off. And they all ended up to be completely observant, all because of this chance connection, this chance meeting with a rabbi from a plane that was delayed in a far off place in Africa. So how do we how do we make it of where we are? How did we end up here? How did we end up wherever we are? We're all in different places. I know these videos are seen all over the world. And some of us are wondering, why are we here? What are we doing over here? What's the purpose of our being in this particular place? So as it says, the steps of man are ordered by God. He has been, you've been sent to that place by divine providence to fulfill a mission in the dissemination of Torah and Judaism. That's why you were sent to this particular place. Uh, and God has sent you to this particular place. You may not have chosen this, but God's chosen for you. The way of God and the way of the Jew is a Jew chooses of his own free will at the place where he has meant, has been sent and the mission to be fulfilled should be his way 
and not just because he has been forced there. But he has to recognize the fact that he's there for a purpose. There's a reason why he is there. Then he delights in his ways. It becomes his will and desire. And he has great delight and enjoyment from it. Once he realizes that there is a purpose for why you're in this place, what you're doing in this place, you will come to accomplish many wonderful things. They are a family who now lives in San Diego ended up in Brawley, California. Brawley is basically in the middle of nowhere. It's in the uh, desert area, the Mojave Desert. And this fellow is a lawyer for the government. And he ended up getting a job in Brawley. What in the world is a Chabad follower with smicha and everything doing in Brawley? But that's where God sent him. That's where God took him at the end. For one reason or another, that's where he ended up. And what did his family do there? First, they had several children. Second of all, they started a Talmud Torah, a Hebrew school. They started holiday programs for locals. There weren't that many, but there were enough locals. And they started doing all kinds of amazing programs in spreading Yiddishkeit there in Brawley of all places. And they lived there for many years until finally they eventually they moved away from there to San Diego. But they recognized the fact that God has sent them there for a particular reason. So instead of moping and groaning and doing nothing, they decided to become shluchim. They decided to become emissaries of the Rebbe in that place, in Brawley. And perhaps we should all learn a lesson from them to be able to do that in our own place, whether we live in large cities or whether we live in small towns or areas. We all can have influences on other people's to strengthen other people's Yiddishkeit as well. So it is really God who does the choosing and sends us to these places where we, are, we end up. The Rebbe says, yet there appears to be a paradox. On one hand, Jews should be united together and not do anything to disturb that unity. We should all be together. What are we doing in far off places, in distant places, separate from each other? On the other hand, each person has a special mission to be performed in his particular place. So is this not paradoxical? Either we're supposed to be in that place or we're not supposed to be in that place. So the paradox, the Rebbe says, is resolved through the saying of our sages. A person does not part from his friend except with saying a word of halacha, of Jewish law. The word of halacha that we learn together prior to to their departure, ensures that in reality, a man does not part from his friend, for through the word of halacha, they, while physically apart, are in reality in a state of unity. If you find that people who live far away from each other, by staying in touch with their friends and their relatives, they are still united with them. They're still together with them. Today, with the miracle of the internet, we have the ability of being in touch with our neighbors, with our friends and our family, and even with total strangers who are Jews who share our outlook on life from all over the world. Every day when I wake up, I check what's happening in the world. There is a site which I tune into called COL Live. It's a Chabad worldwide site. And it'll tell you, oh, so-and-so got engaged. Oh, I know that guy's father. Uh, so-and-so got married, uh, so-and-so is starting a business, this one had a child, oh, mazel tov, this one's having a birthday, so I better send, I'll send them a note, you have a comment section, mazel tov, happy birthday, wonderful news, mazel tov on your new baby, or whatever it may be. We're all in touch with each other. We are in touch with our family. We have family in New York, in Los Angeles, wherever your family is. Through the internet, you can stay in touch with them on a daily basis, even more often than a daily basis. We have that ability of staying together with each other in unity and keeping that unity going, even though we may be so far away from each other. Now, this sicha took place in 1982, probably well before the internet was in full swing. So the Rebbe is talking, but people still can be in touch. They can still be in touch. Uh, and certainly a chassid wants to be in touch with his Rebbe. A chassid 
It wants to have that connection. We call it his kashras. They want it to be connected with their Rebbe. A chassid who lives in Australia is connected with his Rebbe who lives in New York. How, how so? By studying his Rebbe's teachings, by following his Rebbe's directives, by visiting his Rebbe from time to time, by keeping in touch with his Rebbe's community, he is in touch with his Rebbe. So that even though he may live thousands and thousands of miles away from his Rebbe and from his community, nevertheless, he's still connected, he's still in touch. The central Chabad community is, of course, Crown Heights in Brooklyn, New York. Every chassid throughout the world is connected to Crown Heights. We're all connected because that's the Chabad neighborhood. That's where the Rebbe lived. That's where our, our source is. So even though we may live in San Diego or in Brawley or in Anchorage or anywhere we are living, we're all connected to the Rebbe in Crown Heights. And we go and visit from time to time. We are connected through uh, phone calls, through uh, Skype and through through internet sites and things like that. So we always can keep that close connection going, even though we are far away from each other. Uh, the Rebbe said through, through halacha, through following Jewish law, we're also connected. In the area of halacha itself, it must be a word of halacha, the plain outright law, not the reason and clarification for the halacha. It was the halacha itself. We all keep Shabbos, for example. So sometimes it comes out that you need to learn about Shabbos. You don't know everything about Shabbos. So what do you do? You connect with a rabbi who lives, say, in Los Angeles or in a larger city, or you study some books put out by people about Shabbos, and it keeps you connected with the laws of Shabbos and observance of Shabbos. And through this, you don't feel alone. You feel that you're together with others, and you share a, a common bond with other Jews. There are kashrus websites where I was just reading this morning about a prominent kashrus website in Los Angeles. And uh, this p person who, who runs the site keeps in touch with, with agencies all over the world to see which products are kosher and not kosher, which symbols are good, which ones aren't good. And he is in touch with everything. So you need to know what's kosher, what isn't kosher. Rabbi Eilus is your man. He's the guy who can give you some good advice as far as what is kosher and what isn't kosher. And again, even though he lives far away, I haven't spoken to him in several years, but nevertheless, his site is an important site for us to determine these things. And this fosters Jewish unity and that we're all one. I was talking to a rabbi recently who I needed some advice, who, a rabbi who just moved to New Jersey. He used to live in Los Angeles and I used to uh, speak to him from time to time about various matters. And um, I, I'm still in touch with him, even though he lives far away, 3,000 miles away, on another coast. But nevertheless, we're in touch. We are in touch, just like I would be if uh, I, I saw him yesterday. For in a word of halacha, there can be no differences, and all Jews are equal in following the clear-cut halacha. We're all one. We all follow the same halacha, so we're all united in that respect as well. So halacha is uniquely suitable to produce the unity that ensures that a man does not depart from his friend. So as long as we are following the halachas, we're all one in the, in the following the halachas. When a Jew returns home to begin the service of Yaakov Halach Darko, that Yaakov went his way, um, and he spreads Torah and Hasidism and Yiddishkeit, the, that mission begins with the mitzvah campaigns. Loving your fellow Jew, education, Torah study, tefillin, etc., mezuzah, all of these things. In addition, there is the campaign of the present to unite all Jews in an eternal bond through each Jew acquiring a letter in a Sefer Torah. And this, again, is a campaign that exists all over the world. And we all join together with other Jews who are purchasing a letter in the Torah. And we all have the letter in the Torah. And the Torah is composed of some, some 400,000 letters. And each one of us has a letter in that Torah. And we're all united in this respect. So therefore, that makes a, a connection uh, between each and every Jew. So our job, our, our job in this physical world is to get back to work. But to get back to the work in a way of Torah Yiddishkeit, 
prayer, halacha, in, in being a Jew. And when a Jew acts as a Jew, they will be connected and united with other Jews throughout the world because we all have that in common. The most important thing that we Jews have in common is Judaism, if you think about it. But that's really what we all have in common. We all live in different areas. Some live in Israel, some live in America, some live in Europe. But in terms of Judaism, we are all Jews. And that is really what unites each and every one of us. And when Mashiach comes, that unity will become more pronounced and felt more than any other time. So I want to wish everyone a good Shabbos. And uh, it should be a good year for all of us. And uh, in the spirit of unity, of coming together, just as everyone came together in one ark. So we should come together. The word teva in Hebrew means an ark, but it also means a word. As the Baal Shem Tov taught, bo el ha-teva, come to the ark, means the ark, the word teva could also mean word. Come into the word of Torah. The word means teva, means a word. The word refers to Torah. By Jews coming together in Torah, we spread unity throughout the world, and indeed, this will be the precursor when God willing, Mashiach should come. Amen. Ron? Well, that's how you end it, huh? Got it. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay. Okay, be well. Good story.